The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Well, folks, we all know that we're in the last days. I mean, we're living in a day of seduction and rampant lies and fraud. And deception is everywhere you turn. The demonic is revealing itself like never before. It's everywhere, absolutely. It's in governments, politics, education, health care. Propaganda permeates the news media if you have the stomach to look on TV. But there are thousands of alternative sites on the Internet and much of it's promoted by AI, artificial intelligence, we know. And the devil's fast at work at distorting the truth with false, the false, things that aren't true, with lies. And he doesn't have to do very much now to lead people down that primrose path over the edge of the cliff with compromise and partial truth. That's all he needs. And what's worse, ravening wolves in sheep's clothing the Lord talked to us about in Matthew 7, 15, have made their way into many of our God-fearing churches and places of worship all over this country and around the world. And people enter into them and they're deceived because they're, they're embracing half-truths they're listening to, outright false doctrines. They hear no real truth from the Scripture, only stories and feel-good messages. There's not a breath spoken about the grace of God and the cross at Calvary and the precious blood of Christ spilled at that cross. You hear nothing about the sinfulness of men and their desperate need of a Savior. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.1 that in the last days perilous times shall come. And in 1 Timothy 4.1, you know that verse, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. These people, Paul described, have no internal confirmation in their spirit, in their soul, as to what's happening. They don't know what's going on. They base their reality on what seems to be true, but they don't know. So Satan's at work, and we desperately, desperately need godly wisdom and discernment in these times. We need it. We need it. We need to go to it and get it in God's Word. We've got to be saturating our heart and mind with the Word of God. So this lesson, we're going to get into the Word of God and let the Word of God speak to our hearts. And I pray it will help us today as we look at godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. We've got to know the difference. We need the discernment today of Almighty God to help us be focused in the days that we're living in. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. This verse teaches us that the fear of God is foundational to true wisdom. All other types of learning are worthless unless it's built upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the knowledge of the Lord himself. There are a lot of passages that speak to this in the Bible. Proverbs 14.27, Proverbs 15.33, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. Psalm 11, 11, 10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now this verse shows us a sharp contrast between the wise and the foolish. For the unbeliever, the fear of the Lord is the fear of the judgment of God and eternal death in hell. The Lord Jesus said plainly in Luke 12, 5, you know that, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear, fear him, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And then Hebrews 10.31 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For the believer, the fear of God is something a lot different. The believer's fear has to do with reverence of God. Hebrews 12.28 is a good picture of that and paints it well. 
Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. This reverence and awe are exactly what the fear of God means for the Christian. It ought to be a motivation factor, in other words, for us to surrender to the creator of the universe every day of our lives. A wise person fears, reverences, and obeys the Lord God. A fool despises instruction, can't be told what to do, doesn't want to be told what to do. Now listen, the wise person is wise because he started in the right way. He started at the starting place. Where's that? The fear of the Lord. And a fool doesn't have any foundation on which to build wisdom. We all have read many times Romans 1, 21 through 22. What does it say? Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You see that? This is a description of people who try to obtain wisdom and get wisdom while ignoring the Lord God. Folks, it absolutely can't be done for the simple reason that the Lord God is the source of wisdom. The link between the fear of God and wisdom means that there's no way that you and I can have the wisdom of God if we recreate God in our own image. And that's being done today like never before. This world is doing it. And darkness, as a result, is coming in. People today are doing their dead level best to make God into their own image, to be a non-threatening nobody. Now this is important. The moment that we start redefining God, and not according to the Word of God, and the way we want Him to be, as a God that makes us feel comfortable to conform to the culture of the day, and to be permissive, buddy-buddy, you know, the man upstairs, who exists simply to bless us and give us what we want, the very moment any person or any church does that, we won't fear Him in the way that He deserves to be feared. Until we understand who God is and develop a reverential fear of Him, we can't have true wisdom. True wisdom, godly wisdom, comes only from understanding who God is and that He's holy, He's just, He's righteous. Deuteronomy 10, 12 and 20 through 21 records this. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to work, walk, in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul he is thy praise and he is thy God that hath done for these these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen listen when the fear of the Lord is part of every moment of our lives the decisions we make are going to be based on his approval and we live with the knowledge that God the creator of the universe is closely involved in everything we do, every move we make, because He knows every single one of us. He does, inside and out. He sees, He knows, He evaluates all our choices. David knew it expressed this truth in Psalm 139, when he said, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. A biblical fear of God for the believer includes understanding how much God hates sin, and fearing his judgment on sin, even in the life of a believer. Yes, Hebrews 12, 5 describes God's chastisement of the believer. While yes, the Lord chastises in love, it's still a fearful thing, isn't it? Yes, when I was a young'un, I had some fear of this one from my dad. And no doubt it prevented me from falling into some evil things that I could have been doing. And I'm sure y'all identify with that, or at least some of you do, I don't know. <laughs> the same ought to be true, though, in our relationship with God. We should fear His chastisement and walk in the Spirit, seek to live our lives in such a way that pleases the Lord every day of our lives. Psalm 211 and 107, 15 says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Listen, we've got the promises of God in this Word. Romans 8, 28, 38, and so on, says that nothing, nothing can separate us 
from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've got his promise that he'll never leave us nor forsake us in Hebrews 13 5. Fearing God means walking in reverence to him making a difference in the way we live every day of our lives. It's respecting him, obeying him, submitting to his discipline and worshiping him in awe and reverence. When we're walking in the Spirit according to the God's Word because we're in the book, we're in this book. That's our authority. And we know who we are as blood-bought believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we're on the pathway to true wisdom. And everyone in our life that we rub elbows with benefits from it. Proverbs 13, 20 and 19, 8 says this, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. So in the time we have left, let's take a look at James 3. Turn over there with me. It's some very important practical things. Practical things that we need to know about, about godly wisdom and its values and its virtues. And it will compare it to wisdom of the world. James 3, verse 13. And we see here that James is zeroing in on wisdom. In the preceding verses, he had taken a look at examining the tongue, bridling of the tongue and controlling of our words. And now these two things are closely linked together because it takes wisdom to control our words. So he moves now to give us Bible truth about the importance of wisdom and wise behavior. In verse 13, the Bible says, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. He's saying here that, that a wise man doesn't need to boast. The word conversation refers to a lifestyle, one's behavior. Endued with knowledge comes from a word that means to have skill and understanding. It also means to, to know something very well. Now the word for meekness is one that James already used in chapter 1 verse 21 the Bible says that we must receive with meekness the engrafted word when we look at the life of our Lord Jesus even as a boy in Luke 2 40 and verse 52 we see that his life exemplified all these things listen we have to remember that James who lived with him he was blind actually to the wonder of Christ's life until he met the risen Savior at the resurrection. Think about it. He had sat with him at the table. He sat with the incarnate Word, the incarnate wisdom. He'd walked to school with him and walked home with him. He heard the Lord's answers to all sorts of questions. I mean, one greater than Saul, Solomon lived in that home in Nazareth and worked at that carpenter's bench and took the scroll at the synagogue, unrolled it and read and expounded the scriptures. So when James calls on people in the church who profess to be wise to show it, that's what it says, he used an emphatic tense of that word, show it. Maybe think back. He was thinking back over all those years in Nazareth, in the years of the Lord's public ministry. As he thought back, James could have confessed that nobody, nobody has shown wisdom more clearly and wonderfully than the Lord Jesus Christ did. So he's asking, who is a wise man among you? And James, like all the writers of the Bible, he put great value on wisdom. It's greater than monetary power. Proverbs 3.13, it says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding, for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared to her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. And Proverbs 16, 16 tells us how much better is it to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. King Solomon is saying here that wisdom is far greater than all the riches you could ever own. Today, that doesn't seem to be as much the case at all. It's always been that way. I mean, people are seeking after treasure, more and more money, and what they than what they have and what they what is enough. I mean, if you've ever watched Shark Tank, I don't know. We turned it on there every now and then. Good night. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's all about money and getting all I can. 
The Bible teaches that wisdom is greater than that, greater than riches. It also teaches that wisdom is greater than strength, and it's greater than weapons of war. In Ecclesiastes 9.16, it says this, Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. I'm sorry to say, we don't have wise men that I can see in governments of this world. Not a bit. In Washington, the Pentagon, or anywhere else, because Satan's out to steal, kill, and destroy. But remember, the Lord Jesus, who's incarnate wisdom, had the answer to that in John 10.10. 10. He said, I am come that they might have life and have it what? More abundantly. Solomon, who wrote Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, was a great king, at least for the first part of his life. And we know he received godly wisdom from the Lord because he asked for it and God gave it to him. We find that account in 2 Chronicles 1. And Solomon became known throughout the world for his great wisdom. Well, yet in his later years, he turned away from following the wisdom of God he'd been given. You can read about that in 1, King 11, 1 Kings 11. He disobeyed the Lord. He got off track. He began to worship idols. Receiving the wisdom of God, my point is, it didn't ensure that Solomon would follow the path of wisdom. Sadly, we see as he exchanged his godly wisdom for worldly wisdom, and he suffered for it. And the Lord removed his hand of blessing from him, a man who was once great. Nevertheless, God used Solomon to write three books in our Bible. We've been given great wisdom in those three books for us to learn. Proverbs 4, verses 4 through 8 says this, and here we see wisdom is greater and more important than mental power, mental acuity. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall be promote thee, and she shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. Wisdom is the principal thing, folks. And with it you get understanding, and you get knowledge too, and above all, above all, get wisdom. God says to us through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3.19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it's written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. And the passage in James we're looking at shows us there's a difference, a difference between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. Godly wisdom, of course, is from God and honors God. As we've seen, godly wisdom starts with a fear of God and results in a holy life. Worldly wisdom, on the other hand, isn't concerned with honoring God and it's about pleasing yourself. With worldly wisdom, we may be educated, might be street smart, common sense that enables us to play the games in this world successfully for a while. But godly wisdom helps us prepare for eternity. We recognize and know we're citizens of another kingdom, folks. And we make choices that reflect that commitment and love we have for the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.27 talks about that, as does Philippians 3.20. These verses are clear about this. Having godly wisdom, we strive to see life from God's perspective, from God's point of view, and we act accordingly. Listen, every one of us, every one of us are sinful. Every one of us makes mistakes and fail and mess up. But the wise learn from their mistakes and sin. The wise, they look to the Lord for help to avoid repeating them. The foolish can't say that. They don't do it. They make the same mistake over and over and over again and never learn their lesson. Godly wisdom goes against the conventional worldly wisdom of the day. It's not focused on self-preservation, but on getting the gospel message of salvation out to every person they can find. Godly wisdom goes against the conventional worldly wisdom. So what's got to happen? We've got to be living in godly wisdom. 
that can only happen when we're committed to crucifying our flesh and walking by the Spirit. When we know that our lives are not our own. When we're bought, knowing that we're bought with a price to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are God's. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm getting a little off track from James. It's all good anyway, huh? So let's get back to James 3.13. We see how the Bible links wisdom and knowledge together. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Do you see that? Notice that wisdom always comes first and knowledge is right on its heels. You see, if a man has knowledge without wisdom, he may be proud that he knows so much. But wisdom is humble and knows so little. A man of wisdom knows that knowledge is going to always fail if it's not linked to wisdom. See, the wisdom of God gives you the ability to apply the knowledge that you have. It doesn't make any difference whether you're an Albert Einstein or some intellectual giant genius. Jesus says in Matthew 11:25, Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. He's talking about worldly wisdom, about people and intellectuals in this world that think they know it all. God reveals the simple things, the most wonderful things to those who know Him and love Him. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't study and learn. No, 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 no. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I know there are a lot of Christians everywhere who are saved, but they don't have understanding and knowledge. They may have some modicum of wisdom, but the problem is we're not doing what Peter told us to do in 1 Peter 1.13. He said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that it is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've got to get off the couch and gird up the loins of our minds and get after it, studying the Word of God to have the mind of Christ. It doesn't come by osmosis. No. Sleeping on your Bible under your pillow, I tried that, it doesn't work. Listen, I have a problem with laziness sometimes. I know myself, and they don't feel like it blues. At those times, I mean, I've got to take it to the Lord. I take it to Him at those times and ask for help. I know for the past few days while I've been on this pain medicine for this surgery, I mean, I've been asking God for His wisdom to teach this lesson this morning. James said in chapter 1, verse 5, he said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. The Bible says you can ask. You can ask God for wisdom. It never, never tells us to pray for knowledge. It tells us to study for knowledge and to ask for wisdom. There, there's a difference. Wisdom is given by God, and knowledge is acquired by study. Wisdom starts at conversion, folks. You see the Bible in 111 Psalms? Verse 10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Until we come to an honest, reverent fear of God, as I've said, we don't even have a little bit of wisdom. Just very little. We don't have even a little bit. The Bible says to believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is our wisdom. Wisdom starts the moment of our conversion, when we're converted and born again. But because you have Christ, that's the reason. You've got Christ. But godly wisdom is supposed to deepen and grow in Christ and the Word of God so that we'll not be deceived. As Peter told us that in 2 Peter 3, verse 17 and 18. Beware, lest ye also, being led away with error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But, see that but, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so James spent some time talking about the value of wisdom and how important it is for you to have wisdom. It's more important than the strength of your body, getting strength of your body. It's more important that for you to have wisdom than it is to have the doors on your house locked tonight when you go to bed. I'm not saying don't lock your doors, but I'm saying it's more important. So James is asking and giving us the truth in verse 13. Who is a wise man 
and endued with knowledge among you. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. He's saying wisdom is good conversation. That means good behavior. And it's also gentle. It's meek. Meekness is a word he already used in chapter 121. We receive the word. Engrafted word. That means a gentle spirit. A gentle spirit. Softness of temper. According to Webster's 1828, it goes on to say, Webster says, submissive to the divine will of God without murmuring opposed to pride and arrogance. Meekness of wisdom. Now if you have arrogant wisdom and call it true wisdom, the wisdom you've got isn't real. I mean, it's just as phony as a $4 bill, or is it a $3 bill? Phony as can be. When a person is meek, it doesn't mean he's going around looking and thinking lowly of himself all the time. That's not what it means. Meekness is a sweet evenness about life, no matter the circumstances. When a man is meek, he doesn't have to look up to anybody because he knows by the grace of God, he's been made a new creature in Christ. He's got royal blood, but he doesn't have to look down on anybody either, folks. And when a man is meek, he can look everybody straight in the eye. He doesn't have to look down upon the poor, no, or look up to the rich. He doesn't have to look down upon the ignorant. And he doesn't have to look up to the educated. His security is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else, just Christ. He's a person that's meek. And godly wisdom is both good and it's gentle. Now in verse 14 and 15 of James, he gives us four things that will wipe out godly wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, Glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. To have bitter envying folks in your heart literally means jealousy. To have competition, to have contention. Listen, when myself is on the throne of my heart at the house, the result is going to be discord and dissension. Just ask my wife, Donna. She knows all about me when it's all about me. In plain language, the Bible's talking about a bitter spirit, belligerent spirit. The scripture says here, glory not. Glory here carries the meaning of boasting and exalting. In other words, don't go boasting about your wisdom and how wise you are. So here James is warning us about having a boastful spirit. And lastly in this verse, he says, lie not against the truth. The wisdom of God, listen folks, never parts with the company of the truth. James is telling us not to fall into that trap of half-truths, lies, and trickery to promote the cause of Christ. That's a blind spirit. And if that's going on, it's a heart that doesn't know true wisdom. I don't have to tell you, but there are people in churches all over this country and around the world that have fallen for a worldly wisdom. Look at verse 15 again. The wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and de devilish. Listen, you know what? We've had people, many who have visited with us, that have told us that they once attended a church that preached the truth of God, right doctrine, right everything. It was sound, but now it's been watered down to nothing. In other words, they've got a man in the pulpit who's more of a motivational speaker and businessman than he is a preacher of the cross of Christ and the righteousness of God. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen it. The, you, you've seen it on TV and other places, the internet. It's a worldly. It's a worldly wisdom, an earthly wisdom. We're seeing the people of God hungry for the truth, and because they can't find it where they are, they they tune in. They're trying to find it best they can. You know these big mega churches in this country, these other so-called churches around the world that may produce quick results, but their spiritual depth is only an inch deep, skin deep. That's called the Wagner Pan. Peter Wagner, they taught that in seminary. It's a Wagner plan of church growth. Just adapt to the culture. That's hogwash. It's crazy. It's not biblical. They want to change the message and make it palatable to fit the culture. So we're seeing it everywhere. New messages that are more godless by the day. And so the wisdom is earthly or worldly. And James says it's also sensual. That means it's soulish or natural. It speaks of the natural man and has to do with the physical side of man. And he's speaking here of wisdom that springs up from corrupt desires and affections of the natural man. James, James has him out here, man, in his unsaved condition and state of sin. 1 Corinthians 2.14 uses the word this way. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness 
unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And Jude, in verse 19, spoke of such men, saying, These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. Jude, Paul, and James are talking about a person who's natural, sensual, who lives by their senses, by their natural instincts, and mistakenly believes that common sense is God-given wisdom. No, it is not. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's not. He doesn't know the difference. This is how it works. His mind says, hmm, I think I ought to do this. I ought to do such and such thing. His emotion says, I feel like doing it. And his will says, I'm going to do it. That's the way it works. But don't think a Christian can't be deceived like that either. He can if he's not growing in the wisdom of God in this Bible. James is saying it's devilish. It's demonic. Wisdom coming from the world, the earth, the earthly. The devil's in your ear about something and it's contrary to the Spirit of God. He's whispering about something that's contrary. You've heard it and you're in a battle right there. You might not even realize it. The Holy Spirit's been trying to get your attention and you're not hearing the sweet voice of God. How many of us have been there? I have. Let me tell you, without godly wisdom, you're going to fall flat. James has given us a warning. The wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. He's talking about the world, the flesh, and the devil. You see that? Sounds a lot like John. 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For of all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We need to remember and never forget how the devil works. Paul told us in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, no marvel, no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. One thing's for sure, no person can do the work of God or live a victorious Christian life in the energy of the flesh. It just can't be done. Oh, you can try, and there are people doing it every day, every day. There's confusion, James says, in every evil work. Listen, there's been times in my life when I didn't act on the wisdom of God I had. Godly wisdom was absent because I got it confused with the worldly wisdom. You got to know the difference, church, and how to gain godly wisdom. How do you do it? Primarily in learning the Word of God, right here in this Bible. Psalm 119, 169 says, Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Verse 130, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Saturating your heart and mind in God's Word produces a heart of worship and thanksgiving. It also becomes fertile ground for seeds of godly wisdom to start growing. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through the, thy truth. Thy word is truth. He wants us to be set apart from the world, to be sanctified, making godly choices and living godly lives. And we can only do that when His word lives in us and we're abiding in it. As believers, if we ever find ourselves tripped up, living our lives with worldly wisdom instead of the wisdom of God, He'll let you know it. He'll let you know it because He loves you. He loves you. You're His. He'll let you know you've moved away from something most valuable in your life. Others who don't have the Spirit of God, searching out every self-help book they can find and grabbing every new theory that comes along, they're still empty. Still empty. Don't have a clue in their soul. It won't go away because we're not creating God in the image that they want. We're created in the image of God and for God. God's Word tells us the truth. There's not going to be any victory in our lives until we understand the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, until we know that we're nothing without Him. Nothing. So many, instead of humbling themselves before the mighty hand of God, choose to hold tightly to the world's wisdom. And they're so disappointed. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.19 that this worldly wisdom stands as foolishness in comparison to that which is the mind of God. He said it right there. This is what he said. Listen. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise of their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise. They are vain. In our own wisdom, we can see only the circumstances. And when the answer is too great for our own understanding, we start thinking, oh, this situation is too tough. And God's trying to show the worldly wise person doesn't see a way out. So he thinks God doesn't know how to help him either. He doesn't get him out of the situation of mess he's in. That's what the children of Israel came to. Even after the Lord had delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians, they murmured, spoke against God in their limited worldly wisdom. And in Psalm 78, 19, they said, How can God furnish a table in the wilderness? And when they asked that, 
here they were. They reached the edge of Canaan. They reached the edge of that promised land and find it to be everything that it was. And the spies came back and they still, still set limits on the Lord God. They said, no, we can't do it. We can't go in there. There are giants in the land and we don't have the power to defeat them. Remember that? So they turned back and died in the wilderness in their worldly wisdom. Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. If only we'd learn to forsake the world's wisdom and take hold of the wisdom of God and admit we can't do a thing without him. The wisdom of God found in the Lord Jesus Christ is our only hope for victory and change, folks. So let's turn our attention to the last two verses of James 3. It summarizes and focuses on the wisdom from above. It's true godly wisdom as the Word of God lays it out. It's positive. It's absolutely victorious, folks. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure and peaceable and gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. These qualities are wisdom from above. They are. They're a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. The wisdom that's from above is pure. It's peaceable. It's peace-loving, folks. It's gentle, easy to be entreated. It's the idea of forbearance and moderation. It's a picture of a person who doesn't stand up for his rights, but is willing to make room for others. When a person has godly wisdom, he has convictions. But his convictions are about the Word of God. It's not, And it's not rigid and inflexible about things that don't really matter. The wisdom of, that's from above is full of mercy and good fruits. It's not thinking about itself, thinking of others. It's thinking about others. It's steeped in mercy, going about doing good works. Mercy in second nature to God. It is His nature, the nature of every one of us who know Him and have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God and been born again and have the very life of Christ in us. It's without partiality and hypocrisy, absolutely unbiased, absolutely unblemished, not pretending to be something they're not. Godly wisdom's going to be transparent, not putting on airs of holiness or pretending. When a person's truly wise, he can look through the facade and see that every man is somebody whom Jesus Christ died for. A wise person is that way. Turn, if you will, as we close. 1 Corinthians 1, 18-31. I want to read this. I want you all to read it with me and just look at it because it's very important. Paul said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks a seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks a foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Listen, you know, after all have left and gone home, every one of us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ are standing on equal footing at the foot of the cross. Are you hearing me? And standing outside the door of that empty tomb, looking up, knowing the victory's been won, and our redemption draweth nigh. And so in James 3.18, we're given the result, a victory of the wisdom of God. It says, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. It's peace, folks. When there's victory, there's peace. The war's over. 
the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God has won the peace. Amen. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you that you've drawn us here today. Thank you for the truth of your word. Help us, God, to walk in your wisdom. We want the Holy Spirit to have his way, to have free reign in us, dear God, as we enter into the service and bid. Wash us, Lord, with your love and your grace. Lord, please mold us, mold us and make us into your image. That's what we want. Bless and anoint the preaching of your word, Father, and give us ears to hear. May our Lord Jesus Christ always be glorified and lifted up because it's all about Jesus. For it's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? If you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.